All right, family, it's good to be with you today. You guys, you bless me by your presence and worship together. It's so good to be in the house of God. And if you're visiting with us today, we're glad you're here. If you're just checking out Jesus or checking out Eastview, uh, this is who we are, and we hope to reveal more of what we are through the Word in Matthew 26 today. Uh, a couple of things. Uh, so many things happen around here we don't know about. Uh, for the last, you know, 24 to 46 hours in this place, in this auditorium right here, have been over 2,200 fourth and fifth graders in an annual event that we host here, and uh, hundreds of our kids from our church are here, and I just want to let you know that God's working in the hearts of uh, fourth and fifth graders in this place, and if you saw some people bring in today some bags of groceries or some non-perishable items, that's because today is food pantry, food drive day, and we, we are stocking that so we can serve the people in this community because we love them with the ridiculous love of Jesus. So if you brought some today, thank you. If you forgot or whatever, bring it during the week. And we want to serve uh, Jesus in that cool way. Uh, well, I want to say greetings to our online campus. Glad y'all are with us today. I want to say hi to Carol from Tawanda, Greg and Nikki from Huntington Beach, California, uh, Kevin and Diane from Fort Myers, Florida, Caldwell's in Sanibel, and Peebs in northern Wisconsin. Glad you all here, and I uh, hope that you guys enjoy uh, time with us today. Well, I, I'm going to start off with three words to get us to Matthew uh, 26 today. Uh, they're very, very uh, powerful words. The words are, you're under arrest. You're under arrest. These are three words that will get anybody's attention. Uh, and a lot of us in here, if you, if you know the background of the people of Eastview Christian Church, some of us have heard those words before because we were under arrest. And uh, believe it or not, Jesus has done a lot of stuff in our past and what we call B.C., before Jesus. Some of us in here were actually criminals and we've been arrested. And if you've experienced that, you know that's a very intense thing. You're under arrest, right? Some of us, uh, though, have been around people who have been arrested. And maybe some of you grew up in a more urban setting, uh, like where I went to high school. I, it felt like every, son, every day when I came out of school, uh, one of my friends was being put into a police car, and there was an arrest going on. It, it makes you feel a little weird even when you're not the one being arrested, Right? You're under arrest is a very powerful moment. It's powerful for the officer making the arrest, the one being arrested, and all the people around. Maybe you've never witnessed an arrest in real life, but you've still probably seen it, whether you're from the mean streets or Sesame Street, you've probably seen somebody be arrested. Right? Maybe you've seen it on somebody's iPhone, they've posted it, or maybe you watch one of those shows like Live PD or a documentary like The First 48. You've seen people arrested. Well, today's story from Matthew 26 could be an episode on one of those shows because we come to the same garden we were in last week where Jesus was praying, and now the crowd of people have come to arrest him. Jesus, Messiah, Teacher, Lord, Christ, God in the flesh, our king is under arrest. Let's read these words today from Matthew 26, and let's see what the Lord wants to say to us today. I believe he has a powerful message, starting in verse 47. While he was still speaking, Judas came, one of the twelve, and with him a great crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had given them a sign saying, the one I will kiss is the man, seize him. And they came up to Jesus at once and said, and he came up to Jesus at once and said, Greetings, Rabbi. And he kissed him. And Jesus said to him, Friend, do what you came to do. And then they came up and laid hands on Jesus and seized him. And behold, one of those who were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. Then Jesus said to him, Put your sword back into its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Do you think that I cannot appeal to my Father? He will at once send me more than 12 legions of angels. But how then should the Scriptures be fulfilled that it must be so? At that hour, Jesus said to the crowds, Have you come out against a robber with swords and clubs to capture me? Day after day I sat in the temple teaching. You didn't seize me. But all this has taken place that the Scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples left him and fled. Let's pray and ask the Lord to speak to us through this word. God, we read your word because it says even of itself that it is living and active, sharper than the sword that we see here in the garden. God, I pray today you would pierce our hearts, that you would get past all the stuff, all the fears, all the concerns, all the goals and dreams that are personal, and you would get right to the heart of the matter. You would get between our spirit and soul, our joints and marrows, and that you would change us today because of the word. There's some people here who don't really want to change, but I pray you'll do it anyway. 
And then I pray that those of us who need encouragement, those who need lifted, those who need um, spurred on to love and good deeds, that you would do all that in a way that only you can. Those watching online, those here live, God, would you come in this moment by the power of your spirit, change us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, this arrest in the garden is episode three of the King of Kings series that's eventually going to go, you know where it's going to go, to trial, to death, to burial, to resurrection. Seven Sundays from now, we're going to be preaching the resurrection. Uh, Just another reminder, listen, if somebody in your life needs resurrection, then get them here on Easter, here or one of our other places, because we're going to be preaching about how Jesus overcomes death. But here we are again, Jesus in the garden, and he's under arrest. And if you're like me, when you read the Bible, and I think we all kind of, if we're followers of Jesus, we all kind of slide into this reality that we pick sides here, and we pick ourselves as the good guys. It's really easy for me to read this and go, oh, those, that crowd with swords and clubs, uh, those evil chief priests, those terrible religious leaders, and it's easy for me to go, those are the bad guys in the garden, and uh, we're going to talk about them next week, actually, And we'll get to them, but it's easy to identify the bad guys as someone else. But I think this sermon really is about us who are Christ followers today. Um, Today our focus is not going to be on the guards and the priests and the rabble crowd all looking for a fight in the garden. Today I wanted to look at us as followers. Because there were followers in the garden, the disciples, the apostles of Jesus, and they weren't awesome in this crucial moment. They didn't really do all the stuff that they were supposed to do. And so since we're going to talk about the bad guys... Next week, let's talk about those of us who are followers this week, and let's see if we can learn some um, lessons about following Jesus in our day-to-day. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus as Savior and Lord, uh, and you don't follow him, you say, "I I truly, I'm not a follower of Jesus. And here's our confession from the rest of us who are followers of Jesus here today. Uh, We are often like Jesus' followers in the garden. We, We just are like them. But through Jesus, we are becoming the followers he stayed in the garden for. We often fail our master, but he's not failing us. He's never failed us. He's never left us. He's never betrayed us, and he's never denied us. And because of that, we can study this and say we're in process. So let's be in process today. All right, let's be moving as followers closer to Jesus Christ. And we're going to do that by looking at these followers of Jesus in this story. And we begin with the most notorious of all Jesus' followers, a a man by the name of Judas. You've heard the name. Even if you're not a church person, you know the name of Judas. Nobody names their children Judas. Have you ever noticed that? (laughs) Judas has a bad reputation. Judas is a traitor. Judas is a betrayer. Judas is a bad guy. He's a liar. He's a thief. He's a jerk. And all of those are true biblically, except for the jerk word. Uh, That's just one I threw in there. But we would all agree he's the one who's tagged with the betrayal of Jesus Christ. But I want to show you something, even in this passage that Matthew writes in verse 47, before he's even called the betrayer, look what it says. While he was still speaking, Judas came, one of the twelve. He was one of the twelve. He was one of Jesus' closest associates. If there's anybody who had a degree in the first century of Jesus and Christology and and all the things faith-wise, he had it. He had been to school. He had seen Jesus do miracles. He had seen Jesus uh, perform demon exorcisms. He had seen Jesus walk on water. He had seen Jesus calm the storm. He had seen Jesus raise people from the dead. This man was front row seat to the Messiah. And he's one of Jesus' chosen apostles. I just wanted to dwell there for a moment because not only did he witness all that, he was a preacher. He preached the gospel. He went into towns and said, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And Jesus is the Messiah. And he followed him. And he cast out demons in Jesus' name. And he healed in Jesus' name. He was a close follower of Jesus Christ. But ultimately, he betrays Jesus. Back to the scene in the garden and back to that title for him in verse 48. Now the betrayer had given them a sign. The last time we really catch too much of Judas in the book of Matthew, he's there and Jesus is being anointed by Mary and Bethany and Judas is mad because they're spending the money on something so frivolous and really he's just selfish. 
The Bible tells us that he goes immediately, makes a deal with the chief priest, and he's watching for a way that he can betray Jesus. And, and here's the thing that they worked out. You give me 30 pieces of silver, I'll take you to where he prays all the time, and I'll lead the, uh, the uh, charge, and you can arrest him there in the garden in the quiet of the night. So he does. Now, I want to tell you something about what's going on here, and I want to kind of get in your mind this picture and this location. We're in the Garden of Gethsemane. Remember, uh, the, the Mount of Olives covered with, garden, uh, with uh, olive trees. And they're kind of those stumpy, kind of shadowy, eerie kind of things. It's nighttime, maybe 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. And uh, you also have to remember that this is Passover, so thousands of pilgrims have come from all over the world to celebrate Passover. They're probably camping, laying under trees. There are people everywhere. There are shadows everywhere. And now through, the, through these trees come some people with some torches and with some swords. I want you to see this. They come with swords and clubs. We're going to get the swords in just a moment. But none of this surprises Jesus. It might have shocked the apostles. It might have made them go. I, I can't imagine when Judas is leading this band, they're going, Judas, what are you doing? They've been with him for, 12, for, for three years. He's one of them. But none of this surprises Jesus because he knew this is the way it was going to happen from the Old Testament scriptures. Once again, I just want to wave the banner for the Old Testament scriptures. They're important because Jesus thought they were important. Twice in this passage, Jesus says, this has to happen. Why? So scriptures, Old Testament, can be fulfilled. And even in this instance, you can see that in verse 54 and 56, the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. The scriptures are uh, fulfilled. Even in the, in the garden scene, I'll give you three prophecies that are fulfilled. In Psalm 41, 9 says, even my close friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted his heel against me. That's about Judas. Bless you. Isaiah 53, 8 says, by oppression and judgment, he was taken away. This is the arrest of Jesus. Zechariah 13, 7 says, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. And that's what happens here. The shepherd remains and the sheep run away. I, I love this. I've been reading this book by James Emery uh, White. And he says that there are at least 352 distinct Old Testament prophecies about Messiah that are fulfilled in Jesus. You might be surprised in the garden. But Jesus isn't, because he goes, everything in Genesis to Malachi is about me, points to me, and is fulfilled in me. It, by the way, it's astronomical. Take that to the science discussion. The odds of something written 700 years before Jesus lived, 300 and some uh, prophecies about him all being fulfilled, the odds are nearly impossible. And so Jesus knows what's coming, and and he sees Judas, and he knows what Judas is up to. He actually says to him, you know, uh, friend, do what you came to do, because I know what you're up to. But Judas isn't the only betrayer in the, in the story. I can only imagine how shocked the other apostles were, but it wouldn't be long before Peter would deny that he knows Jesus. It wouldn't be long before they all run away. And I think if we Christ followers are honest, we sometimes are Judas in the garden. We may not kiss him literally on the cheek and betray him with the cheek, but our kisses are a little bit more subtle. Look what he says. There's two words here. He comes up to Jesus before he kisses him, and he says, Greetings. Greetings is the Greek word Cairo. It literally means rejoice. It was a common greeting in the first century. How insincere and how untrue. Greetings, Master. You're under arrest. What's up, Master? Just like everything's normal, I just brought some of my friends with swords and clubs to the garden. Greetings. And I believe sometimes that you and I come with our lips saying greetings on the outside, maybe even this morning as we sing songs of praise to him, but on the inside our hearts are completely somewhere else because Judas knew what he was up to. Sometimes I think we kiss Jesus on Sunday by coming to church, but we live worldly during the week. Sometimes we kiss Jesus by acting Christian when in small group, but we live differently when friends are around that are not followers of Jesus are you subtly today giving Jesus a kiss and saying, hey, Jesus, when in fact your heart is very far from him? The other word there that I think is important is he calls him rabbi, rabbi, in the Greek pronunciation. It literally means teacher. But this is subtle because all through the New Testament, all through the story of Jesus and his followers, the apostles usually address Jesus as Lord. But here he is, and in fact, Judas has probably called him Lord many times, but here he is saying teacher, and that's a subtle kiss, that's a subtle betrayer because, betrayal, because Jesus didn't come to be a teacher, he came to be the Savior of the world, he came to be Lord, he came to be the Lord of all. So here's the question for us today, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, is Jesus your teacher, 
Or is he your Lord? We like teacher Jesus because Jesus says nice promises about us and stuff he's going to do in us and how much he loves us. And we love it when Jesus says things that, that care for the poor or care for the downtrodden or care for the outcast. But Jesus says, yeah, all that stuff's true, but I want to be Lord. I don't want to just teach you good things and say nice things you can find in a fortune cookie. I want to be in charge of your life. Is Jesus in charge of your life? Well, Judas said the right things, but he wasn't really living the right things. But here's what I want you to see. Jesus doesn't resist in the garden. He faces it. Scripture says it. Here comes Judas. It's all getting ready to go down. Even as he was betrayed, he anticipated how our betrayal would become forgiveness and relationship for all betrayers through his death, burial, and resurrection. I want you to hear this. If you have betrayed Jesus, or if you sometimes betray Jesus, he's not running. He went to the cross and died for you so that after the betrayal, you can come back and say, I'm sorry, Jesus, Lord, I want you to have everything that I am. So back to the arrest as we look at another follower in the garden that night. The crowd who came to arrest Jesus were armed. They were armed with swords and clubs. And I can imagine as they closed in, you know, Ju Judas comes up, gives Jesus the greeting kiss, backs away, because he says to them, arrest him immediately. I can imagine this crowd with swords and clubs moving in to grab Jesus. And in that moment, Peter decides he's going to, he's going to draw his sword, and he begins hacking away. We'll get to him in just a moment. Now, uh, if you're uh, new here, you're going to have to endure one of the greatest things that I, I do around here, the talent of drawing and so uh, this is, oh my gosh, I started off really badly, but whatever. This is kind of something I want to talk about today. This is the sword. That's not bad. That's third grade quality. <laughs> uh, the, the word for sword in the New Testament that is used here is really not a sword. Don't think of a saber. Don't think of some long uh, sword that you might see in some combat. This is really more of a dagger. It's short. It's, it's, no, it's no longer than 18 inches. And true to his wide-eyed, impetuous self, Peter wildly takes a swing to cut off a man's head with a knife like this, and he only gets the ear. Now, either Peter was an incredible aim, and he said, I'm just going to slice a little bit off of his ear. Or he's a terrible aim. He was hacking at his head, and he just got the ear. I don't know exactly how this happened, but this thing quickly could have escalated in the garden. It could have turned into a bloodbath. Gethsemane could be a totally different story if it went down the way that Peter wanted it to go down. And there's at least three reasons why his action, his chopping with the sword seems plausible. So let's just look at it from his perspective in the first century before we learn stuff about our following and the swords that we sometimes swing. First of all, Peter and the disciples, him, him fighting and, and swinging a sword seems like the right thing to do. In fact, actually in a culture that, a word that we throw around in our culture, it seems like justice. Because Jesus is being unfairly arrested. If there's anybody innocent ever, it's Jesus. He's never done anything wrong to anybody. He's guilty of no crime. He's guilty of no sin. If there's any time to fight for someone who's being arrested and they really don't deserve it, this must surely be the time. And so Peter draws a sword. I want to just see this, that Peter's not the only one expecting a fight. Here's another reason why you might draw your sword, because they have swords. They started it. They came into the garden with swords and clubs, and they're getting ready to, to and they probably expected some kind of military resistance. That's why it's so powerful. That's why Jesus mocks them. He says, hey, just two days ago, I was sitting on the steps of the temple teaching you guys. You didn't touch me. Why not? Because it wasn't the time. Scripture must be fulfilled. But Jesus knew that they were going to come. They were expecting a fight. They, you don't go to the garden with swords and clubs unless you're expecting a fight. So it's really, it, it, Peter could go, well, Jesus, they started it. They came with swords and clubs. They were going to kill you and kill us. So I just, I just defended us before it happened. The third but most important reason is that even though Jesus had repeatedly told him his kingdom was not of this world, they still expected the Messiah to be a military ruler. That's all the disciples, by the way. Peter's the bad guy. He's the only one that swung wildly and, and, you know, struck blood and cut somebody's ear off. But in Luke twenty two forty nine, 49, when Luke tells this story, he says, when they got uh, ready to arrest Jesus, they all asked, Lord, shall we strike with the sword? They were all ready to go. 
Oh, we're in the Garden of Gethsemane. You're going to try to arrest the Messiah. It's on. Let's go. And they were ready to draw their swords. We know that Simon the Zealot, at least one of the followers of Jesus, was a zealot. Zealots always carried a, a knife on them because they were ready for revolution. So they had swords. They said, Lord, shall we strike with a sword? Apparently, Peter didn't wait for an answer. <laughs> he says, oh, I know what you're going to say, and he starts hacking away. The problem, listen to this, if you're writing stuff down, this is something to write down. The problem with the sword in the garden is that Jesus didn't need an army. He needed followers. He didn't need an army. He says, hey, here's the way Jesus rolls. He says, listen, Peter, if I'm scared of these guys with swords and clubs, I'll just call 12 legions of angels. A legion, by the way, is a big number. 5,500 to 6,000, the Roman legion in the army. Jesus says, I could call 72,000 angels just like that, and these guys would be smoked. Don't worry about them with their swords. This is not a military conquest. This is not something that I need your help with. Peter. In fact, I'm going to face this because it's exactly why I came. I don't, I, I, just, listen, Jesus doesn't need your sword. He needs you to follow him. He needs you to trust him even when it looks like things aren't going the way they're supposed to go. Peter isn't the only Christ follower who often strikes out against the perceived enemies of Jesus. Do you know that as disciples and followers in the 21st century, we're pretty good at swinging our swords. I could identify probably 10 or 20 of them, but I'm going to identify at least four of them today um, that you and I sometimes swing in the name of Jesus. And I, I, my intention with these swords is to make everybody here mad. <laughs> Not really. Conviction is really the word. We swing the sword of politics. Never have I seen in my entire lifetime a time where we are swinging the sword of politics. And some Christians are swinging it in the name of Trump, and some of us swing it in the name of anybody but Trump. We would elect the devil instead of Trump. Or we would let, take Trump, and we are swinging the sword. And if you're swinging the sword in the name of Jesus, and you're trying to fix the world through the politics that you believe in, you're swinging the wrong sword. And Jesus is looking at you and saying, put your sword away. If you think Jesus is concerned about the elections, in, he's got the world and the universe at his disposal, and he cares about every one of us and everything of our lives. But if you think he's worried, he's up in heaven going, man, I hope this election turns out okay. <laughs> That's, he's not worried about it. He can take anybody on or off the throne anytime he wants. He can take anybody out if he wants. He can take the whole world out if he wants. He can call 12 legions of angels anytime. Stop swinging the sword of politics. Some of us swing the sword on social media. Oh, man, it's a dangerous sword. I always cringe every time I see somebody giving some sharp word, sharp-tongued opinion, and I look up and I see their bio that says Christ follower. I'm like, oh, don't say that. Because you look like Peter in the name of Jesus hacking somebody's ear off because you've got this great, uh, you know, this great opinion that's going to change the world because you post it on your site. And if you get 15 or 20 likes, you did it. But really, I think we're swinging these swords often in the name of Jesus on the social media, thinking we're standing up for Jesus and for what's right, or maybe just what we want to. And they're harsh, and they're spiteful, and they're even hateful words in the name of Jesus. And all we're doing is cutting people's ears off so they'll never hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen? So there's a sword. Politics, social media, I'm just getting warmed up. There's another sword of opposition. Do you see this in this story? Us versus them. It's us versus them. This is really simple. I'm Peter. I'm a good person, follower of Jesus Christ. He chose me. You're with the high priest. You're with the rabble crowd. You are bad. We are good. Man, something you and I do all the time. We have a tendency to label people based on what we have heard them say or what we've seen them say or what we think they're about. We, it can be a different skin color. It can be another, a different socioeconomic reality. It can be somebody from a different place. We have opinions about people. We see them and go, I know you, you're there. But in the kingdom of God, there is no us and them. In the garden, God, Jesus is going, well, there's the Son of God and then there's all y'all. That's the two divisions. Me, perfect, the rest of you. And by the way, Jesus came into the garden to die for the chief priest and the, and the Pharisees and the crowd just as much as he did for Peter. So we need to remember that. 
This is not us versus them. The fourth sword is really going to shock and surprise you because it seems really righteous. I'm going to put this on either side of the sword. It's a double-edged sword. And one side is truth. And some of us are swinging the truth sword. If you don't repent, you're going to go to hell. Repent or die. I'm right, you're wrong. Jesus is right, you're wrong. The Bible is right, and you're wrong. And the truth is that that's the truth. You're just hacking people to death with it. On the other hand, some people are hacking with the grace side. And we're just saying, oh, you're fine. You don't need to change. Just be yourself. God loves you as you are. And that's true. But it's not true when you're hacking with just one side. You see, grace and truth, John 1 says that Jesus came and was full of grace and truth. They have to go together. You can't hack with the grace side, and you can't chop off ears with the truth side. In fact, guys, you know this. Those of you who are people of the Word, you say, please say Ephesians 6.17. I will. <laughs> Ephesians 6.17 says that you're to take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. But you don't hack with it. Hebrews 4.12, one of my favorite preaching passages, says the word of God is a double-edged sword. One side is grace, the other side is truth. But the word is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, joints and morrows, discerning thoughts and intentions of the heart. Can I tell you something? The Lord doesn't need us to hack people with grace or truth or politics or social media or opposition. He needs us to slightly and lovingly insert the Word of God into people's souls. It's not for hacking, it's for thrusting. And when we live the life that says we follow Jesus and we give it to people, then the Word of God does the piercing. That's how we use the sword. Jesus doesn't need a fearless army to take his enemies out. He needs some fearless followers who will love his enemies in. And we do that through the word of God. We do that by following the word Jesus and living out the word that we know in Scripture. This scene is a picture of what Jesus came to do. It's not a time for drawing swords in the name of justice in the garden, but a time for his healing touch. That's why in the midst of all the sword swinging, by the way, say sword swinging about five times really fast. In the midst of all the sword swinging, now I'm going to focus on it, <laughs> Jesus brings healing. I want you to see this. If it was left to man, if it was left to the followers of Jesus and the enemies of Jesus, this would have been a brawl in Gethsemane. But it was instantly stopped because Jesus said, put your sword away, and he brought healing to the injured servant. Jesus didn't come to defend himself with a sword. He didn't come to spill the blood of his enemies. He came to go to the cross to shed his blood for his enemies. And you should be happy about that because you and I, because of our sin, were at enmity with God. But he came to die for us and give his blood so that you and I could live. Well, one last glimpse at the Christ followers in the garden. You see it there in the last verse. They all left. They all fled. To say in our language, when it came down to it, when it came down to being the followers of Jesus Christ, they ran like scared kids. Now that the bra bravado of the Lutz fight is over, in the middle of the night where they're probably tired both emotionally and physically, confused by all that's just happened and scared by what's getting ready to happen because their Messiah is under arrest, all the followers left him. Again, I want to remind you, um, on that night, on the side of the mountain that boasts an olive, uh, olive tree forest, it would have been easy for them to disperse. You'd run about around a few trees, and you hide in the shadows, and all of a sudden, you're not the one that's being arrested. In fact, next week, we'll find that Peter's kind of following the crowd, ducking behind trees, all the way to the courtyard of Caiaphas's house. I imagine the 11 apostles flee in all directions. They duck wherever they can. They stay in shadows. Maybe they ran to their home. We only know where two end up. We know that Peter and John both end up in Caiaphas's courtyard, down uh, through the valley, along the eastern su and southern walls of the city, through a set of steps that go right up into that courtyard. Those steps are still there today. You still see them. And that's where the arrest went down, and that's where some of them ran uh, to 
But I, I want to just encourage us one more time here today to take a look at ourselves because we have a tendency to run sometimes. I, I, again, it, I, I love, I love Sunday mornings that we get to get uh, together and we get to say together what we truly believe about Jesus. And, and it's kind of like a positive peer pressure because we're all here and we believe these things that we're saying about Jesus. And we're true, the word, we believe the word is true and we want to follow Jesus but I, you know this, when you leave here, it's a little harder. It was easier to be a Christian 50 years ago in America. It was kind of actually popular if you said, hey, I go to church on Sundays. People were like, yeah, that's cool. Me too. It's not that way anymore. So our students in college and our students in high school, they face a really volatile reality where people don't like them. In fact, people might not like them at all because they're Christians or because they're members of Eastview or because they're trying to share their faith. Some of us run from conversations in the office place. Some of us run from conversations with our neighbors about Jesus because if we say that we're Jesus followers, they're going to think a million bad things about us, and we're frankly scared. So we run from conversations. We run from publicly associating ourselves with the faith. We run from the Bible because the Bible is true, and the Bible doesn't give quarter for what you believe and I believe. It just says this is the truth. We run from it. I don't know what you're running from today, but I know that when it gets hard, when Jesus gets handcuffed and led off to jail, it's easy for disciples to run. I hope, that you, um, I hope that you're challenged today not to run in your faith just because it's unpopular or it's a little bit scary to stand up for Jesus. We need bold Christians now more than ever. But Jesus didn't run. He stayed. There were other times where he got away. You just read the Gospels. There were other times they tried to arrest Jesus or stone Jesus or throw him off the edge of the hill, like in Nazareth, and the Bible just says he slipped away. I don't know if he's like zapped and he went away, or he was just really clever and he knew all the directions. I don't know. I know that they tried and wanted to arrest him before, but they didn't. But now he stays, he extends his hands and says, it's time. And he remains faithful to his calling to save us from our sins. And so here we are in the garden. Jesus is under arrest by the religious leaders, and he's abandoned by his followers. But the king's arrest in the garden isn't the only arrest that's going down. In less than three days, almost all of these followers who failed in the garden, who hacked people's ears off in the garden, who betrayed in the garden, who fled from the garden, in three days, in less than three days, they, most of them were back following Jesus like never before. There was only one exception. After the garden arrest, as far as we know, Judas and Jesus never get face to face. Judas never comes back. Why? I don't know. But because I know who the Savior is, if he would have returned and sought the forgiveness that only Jesus can give, I have to believe that my Lord and Savior would have forgiven him. It's what he did with Peter. It's what he did with the 12. It's what he did with Thomas. It's what he's done with me. It might be too late for Judas today, but it's not too late for you. And if you're watching online and you're going, man, that's my story, and I need forgiveness, there is a Savior that will forgive you today. And if you're here in this place and you don't know Jesus as your Savior, there is a Savior, no matter what you've done, where you've been, how treacherous you've acted against Jesus, he will take you back. And this scene is proof. Because after all of his friends left him, Jesus went to the cross. His arrest in the garden would be overshadowed by another arrest. His death, his burial, his resurrection is the final word. Here's the end of the story. Not Jesus, you're under arrest, but death, you're under arrest. Let's stand and proclaim this truth together in song.